Mr. Wong is Managing Director of the China International Capital Corporation. There we go. Nick Lardy is Senior Fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics. Zhu Gao is the Chief Economist at China Everbright Investment and Asset Management. Lu Fong is Professor of NSD Director, China Macroeconomic Research Center. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and asked to do this. Good morning, gentlemen. Journalists are always obsessed with the new and the latest thing. So overnight, there was an increased amount of flexibility introduced into the trading of the Chinese currency. Uh, I won't go into all the details. I assume a lot of the audience understands it. Um, what do you think that means in terms of what that says about the Chinese government's view of where the currency is going and where the future of financial regulation is going? Okay. Mr. Wong. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, um, I'd be happy to um, uh, share my thought uh, about uh, this important question. Uh, Chen Qing just uh, laid out a uh, very clear uh, you know, um, outline about China's growth. Uh, baseline, I think, is very clear. Uh, he also, uh, in his presentation, mentioned that uh, he expects renminbi exchange rate will be stable uh, you know, uh, going forward for this year. Uh, if we look at the RMB exchange rate, uh, I think that uh, uh, since uh, you know, the, uh, in August 2015, uh, the RMB exchange rate was under some pressure. And then uh, uh, things start to stabilize uh, last year. Uh, notice body uh, in April, uh, China's reserve start to uh, rebound to, uh, from below $3 trillion to above $3 trillion. And then in uh, June, July, uh, RMB uh, start to appreciate against dollar. Uh, Chen Qing showed a chart, I don't know whether you noticed that. Uh, actually, in the second half of year, uh, you know, RMB rebound qu quite strongly against dollar. And uh, for the whole year, RMB appreciated against the US dollar by about 6.7%. I think that's where we are. So we need to think about where, you know, where we come from. So I think that uh, the uh, announcement uh, you, you mentioned about uh, you know, increasing further uh, flexibility, I, I think it's mean to uh, basically uh, push for further reform on exchange regime, that means that RMB will become uh, more, uh, more flexible. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, given that uh, China's reserve, uh, uh, you know, uh, start to uh, stabilize and rebound, given that uh, RMB actually had, uh, you know, appreciated um, uh, about 7% last year, I think that's the, the condition for, for China to push for further exchange reform uh, is ready. I think that's the, that's the first point. Secondly, I think it's related on that is, uh, uh, you know, I, I think in China in the new year, we expect uh, we'll continue to push for financial reform. I, I, I will come back on the you know, uh, mm -hmm. different measures of possible financial reform. Okay. Let me stop here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lard, I'd like to know what you think, and I'm going to add a layer to the question, which is some of the analysis I read is that the, uh, they were comfortable doing this because they had introduced new capital controls, which meant they were less concerned about capital flight hurting the currency, and so they were more comfortable allowing this flexibility. What do you think? Well, I think uh, I agree with Haijo. Basically, this is a continuation of a long-term trend of, of uh, liberalization of the exchange rate. It started many years ago. It's gone step by step. And I think this move reflects the confidence in the central bank in uh, that the exchange rate is near uh, a fairly uh, you know, equilibrium level. There's not a lot of pressure uh, in either direction. They got there in part by enforcing some of the exchange controls that had been, uh, shall we say, overlooked or not fully enforced uh, uh, in the past. Mr. Zhu or Mr. Liu, do you have any strong disagreements with what you just heard? Anything you want to add? I, generally speaking, I agree with uh, my colleagues' assessments of the situation, but uh, I think overall speaking, uh, the exchange rate and the movement should be uh, uh, looked at through a combination of the domestic factors in China as well as, you know, and the uh, situation in this country, especially the relative strength of the U.S. dollar, you know, macroeconomic situation. So, so the given uh, the macroeconomic situation in both of the country, I think uh, uh, it's reasonably uh, to expect, you know, the exchange rate of the IMB this year is going to be uh, 
uh, stabilized because the macroeconomy as outlined by Dr. Chen Xiao uh, is stabilized in recent years and can, it's, it's, it's expected to continue to be the case. And on the other hand, I think, uh, you know, the external, how can I say, account, the transaction account has been uh, stabilized in recent years, you know, so it allowed uh, the authority of the PBOC in China, you know, take a relatively, you know, uh, comfortable policy stance towards uh, the exchange rate policy, as well as, you know, to allow more flexible uh, movements exchange rates much more and even more determined about the market mechanism. I, I'm going to add another layer to the question just to be troublesome. You want to make a prediction, Mr. Liu, when we're going to see the renminbi float completely freely? How, so, how long will that take? Yeah. For the, Mr. Liu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, that's my turn. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think um, the exchange rate, RMB exchange rate, will maintain a stable uh, volatility in, uh, in this year. And uh, because you know that the uh, movements in exchange rates are not always determined by the economic fundamentals, and there are self-fulfilling prophecies in the exchange rate market. So that's in, that is why it is so important to maintain a stable expectation in that market. And uh, we all see that uh, how uh, unstable exchange rate expectation can can do after the uh, exchange reform in 2015. So I believe that the Chinese government will uh, maintain a stable exchange rate expectations, and uh, so I believe the volatility in the market will be uh, relatively uh, stable, and uh, the exchange rate um, RMB against US dollar will also be stable in this year. Okay, um, so in the previous presentation that we saw from Quin Zhao, he said 2018, 6.7% growth expectations, he thinks, in GDP. I'd like to just set the, st the table here for where you guys agree, disagree, you float around that number. Um, what are your expectations? So we kind of get a sense of what you think the overall outlook. Um, our chief economist sitting uh, in, our, uh, in, in the audience, and she will be speaking in the second panel. I think that uh, um, our view on China's growth is uh, uh, slightly, uh, I think, that more optimistic because I think we agree with uh, Chairman Qin Xiao. He laid out the baseline. We think that uh, the situation could be slightly better than the baseline. So we think that uh, the uh, China's GDP growth rate for the 2018 would be somewhere around uh, 7%, you know, up from 6.9% or 6.8%. That's the number for uh, uh, 20, uh, 2017. So that's, uh, that's our view. Mr. Lardy? Well, I, um, I, don't, I don't disagree with the short-term outlook. I think it's likely to be slightly better than whatever this past year turns out to be. But I do think when we look at the medium term, when we talk about a new era uh, for the Chinese economy, I think I, I would say it will, not be, it will not achieve full success unless they deal with some of the legacy issues. There are some very important legacy issues that are slowing down China's growth. I think the potential growth is well above where we are now. But we have a situation in which 40% of all state companies uh, can't cover their cost of capital. They're losing money. Um, the share of losses uh, relative to GDP or any other metric has increased dramatically over the last uh, four or five years. And a very large share of these companies are borrowing huge amounts of money just to cover their their interest costs, in other words, they're capitalizing their interest. We see this in the leverage ratio of state companies. State and private companies used to have a similar leverage ratio prior to the global financial crisis. The private companies have come down and the state companies have surged way ahead. So there still is a major problem of misallocation of resources that is dragging down economic growth below potential. We will, get, we will discuss a lot of those things coming up. But first, Mr. Zhu, what do you think? GDP. OK, I have the same forecast number as Dr. Qin Xiao. The, I think that the Chinese, and the, as well as the world, world economy, is in a much better shape than it was three, uh, two years ago. But I'm not fully convinced that uh, we have entered a new area, because I can still identify several major risks faced by Chinese economy and world economy. Uh, the first one is the cooling property market in China. You know that China has the longest uh, property boom in the past two years, in the decade. 
and uh, the share of uh, real estate loan in the real estate loan loan in the total newly increased loan reached a decade high, and uh, property price also goes up. But uh, on the back of the uh, on the back of the rising property price, the property control measures has been has been tightened, and uh, credit flow to the uh, real estate market has also been cut. You know that in China, maybe it may be exaggerated to say that uh, property investment is the mother of all business cycles in China. But uh, given its huge size, I think it uh, do play an important role in China's uh, business cycles. So cooling property market, I think, may may give some headwind to the to the Chinese economy. And the second uh, uh, headwind I, I see is the uh, tightening monetary conditions globally. You know that. Uh, the Fed has, re has hiked the interest rate several times, and the interest rate in China has also uh, goes up, uh, gone up for, uh, significantly in last year. And um, you know that if you look at the credit growth, credit growth in the United States and China has been slowing significantly. And if you look at the U.S. data, credit growth in the manufacturing sector slowed, uh, growth in the real estate, real estate sector slowed, and the credit flows to the consumers in the United States also slowed. And the, to me, it seems that the higher interest rate has hurt the credit demand in the real economy. And uh, that is not what you expect to see in a long-lasting, sustainable recovery. And the third one, I think it is the uh, looming risks of the trade frictions between China and the United States. You know that if you look at the trade, uh, U.S. trade deficit with, with, with respect to China, it has increased uh, visibly in, in last year. And I think this, to a large extent, a result of a desynchronized business cycles in China and the United States. You know, China, because it has taken a leading role in the global recovery, it has, uh, it has passed its peak. But the US, U.S. is still on its upward trend. In that sense, that uh, demand from uh, China to the United States is, has started to moderate. But demand of the U.S. Uh, from U.S. To, to, to China's goods still very strong. So we see a, a riding, widening the uh, trade deficit. And uh, you know that uh, uh, given the backdrop of the uh, midterm elections in the United States, I think the trade issues could be politicalized in this year. Could be. Could be, could be. <laughs> and may Are. lead to some trade frictions uh, <laughs> between these two countries. I think that is something we should avoid, but this is definitely a risk we should uh, we should identify. So given the all this risk, I still I believe that the bottom line is we are in a recovery, but uh, I think the recovery is still very fragile and uh, we should be cautious. Mr. Liu. So I worked uh, uh, in a university, so I don't uh, uh, pretend I know, you know, and what uh, happened about the specific figure about the GDP growth rate next year, but uh, generally speaking, uh, I agree with the uh, you know, projection provided by my colleagues. I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, the growth rate of Chinese economy will continue. The momentum you know, has been uh, created in the last year, and we're doing well this year. But I think, analytically, I think uh, in Chinese economy still have a great potential you know, and to sustain relatively high growth rate, but I think it depends on whether they can solve a lot of problems in the domestic economy. I, I, would like, I think there's some kind of the dichotomy if you observe in Chinese economy. Uh, number one, it is the dichotomy between the new economy and the traditional economy. You will see the new economy like the IT, you know, internet sector are growing, uh, new energy sector are growing very well in China, very dynamic. But the traditional economy, you know, and troubled by the institutional uh, problems, you know, they still have a struggling, you know, in a lot of sectors. And num number two, the economy is about, you know, and the private sector and the SOE. SOE, as mentioned by <coughs> Dr. Lati, you know, still have a lot of problems. For example, the capital return for SOE uh, you know, in the year before last year, it was something like, oh, sorry, capital return for the uh, private firms in, in the industrial sectors uh, the year before last year was something like 2.4 times as high as the uh, SOEs. So in other words, the proficiency, you know, uh, uh, profitability as well as efficiency in the 
private sector is much higher, you know, suggested by this number, you know, in, in, in China. So whether you can, how can I say, type out the potential of the growth of the private sector is the key issue. Number two, I think the dichotomy is about the different regions. You can see in the coastal areas, like the Zhejiang, like the, you know, Guangdong, and the economy are doing very well. But in certain areas, like the Northeast, they're troubled by, you know, uh, endowment factors as well as institutional distortions. Then I think whether you can sustain reasonable growth rate, growth rate uh, suggested by my colleagues, I think uh, very important, very importantly, it is whether China can address these kind of dichotomies. So that dovetails with what you were talking about, Mr. Lardy. Um, if you were to read the assessments in the Western press of the most recent party Congress, uh, a lot of people here were, were very disappointed. It reflected more support of the state-owned enterprises, more government intervention into the economy. As you have met, two of you have highlighted, really poor returns on capital and a crowding out of the private sector. Were we right to be disappointed in what we saw coming out of the party Congress? Well, I, <clears throat> I certainly think in, in certain respects the, the speech was a disappointment for those who uh, are looking for you know, implementation of the third plenum reforms of the 18th party Congress from the fall of 2013. On the other hand, the role of the market was mentioned quite a few times in the speech. Uh, the Constitution was revised to include that third plenum language about the market being the decisive force in the allocation of resources. So my read on this is pretty simple. I think a lot of these speeches are written by committees. Uh, there are many, many points of view involved in the drafting process. Everybody gets a paragraph, and so you have a, a somewhat inconsistent message. So what I do is, you know, let's watch and see what actually happens. Uh, I don't think the, the speech is necessarily going to be the definitive guide uh, to what happens over the next five years. Mr. Wong, what's your prediction for just how much actual support is going to go to the SOEs? Is there going to be reform or not in that sector? Uh, I think that uh, at the CICC, um, uh, we are involved with, uh, actually, we are you know, um, we are a very important uh, institution uh, uh, to help the Chinese government work with the Chinese government mm -hmm. on SOE reform. Uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, all the SOE reform, I, I think the CICC was at the frontier, and we did most of the large SOE listing in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, and, you know, so. Um, we have been involved with SOE reform from, you know, uh, tw two decades ago. And, 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 and we are confident that there will be uh, important developments and uh, you know, uh, growth driven by SE reform. And uh, I think that uh, 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 Nick Nally mentioned that uh, you know, he made a very important point, which is that uh, you know, going forward, uh, you know, uh, we need to watch closely for our, our implementation. I think that, that there will be important development in the implementation of the uh, so the planning sessions, you know, outline on SA reform. Such as what? Uh, such as basically that I, I think that uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we hope. We, well, let's say that uh, six months from now, probably the uh, case of China Unicorns uh, reform will be discussed by the press. Okay, uh, we we don't have liberty to talk about that yet because we CICC was at the center of that. But I think that's that's what could be a showcase for SA reform. Yeah. Let me ask a more broad question, um, Mr. Liu or, or Mr. Zhu, if you want to answer this. In the United States, for the most part, if you ask the following question, you'd get a certain answer, which is to divide a nation's resources to do the most good for the most people, would it be the market or the government? What would be better at it? And up until recently, I would have argued that the vast majority of Americans would say the market. If you go to France, the vast majority of the French will say the government, for example. If you had senior leaders behind closed doors in China, how would they answer that question? <laughs> it's a very interesting question, actually. <laughs> Yesterday we have a closed door meeting for the whole day, actually, you know, and 
uh, there's a different opinions among the economists and the colleagues, you know, uh, to different uh, specific issues. I think it uh, still depends, you know, it depends on which issue are talking about, what kind of context. For example, just now you talk about, uh, you know, the recent document, the recent Congress, you know, and uh, policy stands up the reform. Actually, I remember uh, immediately after uh, the closing of the finish of the 19th Congress, uh, one diplomatic staff of the United States Embassy in Beijing, you know, and visited me in Peking University, you know, he asked me the similar question, you know. He also gave me a very interesting evidence to support this question. He said, on the basis of his calculation, you know, the uh, reform mentioned in the Congress, uh, in the, uh, Mr. Xi's speech in 19th Congress was four times, you know, but in the past, usually, it could be dozens of times. So it's whether quantitatively, you know, it has been taken as a quantitative evidence whether, you know, the priority of the reform has been declined. Uh, I think it's a very interesting observation, you know, but uh, I, I, uh, as an economist, I also, number one, I also uh, fully agree that China's economic growth achievements in the past decades, you know, has been mainly, you know, and brought about by the reform, vigorous reform and policies. And also sometimes, you know, you take a zig and zag, you know, and uh, transactions. In the future, I think we still need to do a lot of reform, like the SOE, like the land reform, even the financial sectors. We still need a lot, a lot of reform, you know, to imperfecting the market mechanism. But on the other hand, when China's economy get into the new stage, then there's a lot of new issues. For example, like the environmental issues, like the income distribution issues. All these issues, you know, maybe in some occasions, the market mechanism can still play a role, okay, to account at least to dealing with the issues. But on the other hand, I think the government role uh, will be also, you know, and uh, emphasize on that. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, you know, Justin Lin, Professor Justin Lin, you know, later uh, keynote speech, he will uh, mention this issue again. So finally, I want to me mention, you know, in the history of China's economic reform, there are always sort of the balanced approach towards the market and uh, uh, government. So in other words, you know, the dichotomy you know, between states and the French may not be that kind of realistic in China's case. Mr. Xi. Okay. Well, to reinforce Lu Feng's point, I think there is no one size fits for all model for every country. And uh, in, as economists, we know that in theory, we can prove the market can achieve first best resource allocation, but that is only in ideal conditions. Reality is much more complicated than that. China is still a transition economy. We certainly have a lot of uh, legacies inherited from the command economy. And these legacies, they still uh, give a strong, they still have a strong impact on the functioning of the market in China. So in order to maintain stability and uh, increase the efficiency, we should take a more pragmatic approach to solve problem by solve problem. And uh, so you can see, obviously, that there is a, a kind of zigzag uh, path uh, mentioned by Lu Feng. And sometimes we have uh, two steps ahead and one step backward. I think that is normal, because we are trying to solve the problem of how to rebalance, how to reform Chinese economy towards a more market-oriented uh, model. And that is an experiment that nobody has has ever faced before uh, in such a big country. So we have to take the old bro approach, crossing the river by groping stones, and uh, which means that uh, you do not have a straight line in your path, and you have zigzag. Ideas. So, so I'm, my point is that you, you, you shouldn't interpret too much in the, uh, of this short-run phenomenon. But if you look at a long-term trend, it is very clear that China is moving towards a more market-oriented economy. And that is the message uh, continued to be sent by our senior leaders. Mr. Wang, do you think that the Chinese leadership believes uh, a market-based economy is the better way to allocate resources? 
Uh, I think that uh, ideally we need to have a uh, you know, capable government working with an efficient market. There is a Chinese saying, which is say that uh, but how to get the mix right, I think that's, all, that's, a, you know, that's, that's really uh, it's, it's, it's an art and also it's a science. I think that it uh, takes a lot of effort. Mr. Lardy, what do you think? Well, I begin with the observation that I don't think there's a unified view at the top. I, I think there's a range of opinions. There always has been. There's always debate about you know, what the appropriate mix is to deal with various issues. I think over the last five years, though, the center of gravity has moved more towards a, a greater role for the state, uh, a greater role for state-owned enterprises, uh, and more, more intervention in the economy. And we've seen the private sector has weakened uh, over this period. Uh, compared to its previous trajectory. Why do you think that is? Well, I think in part it's crowding out, which you mentioned earlier. I think credit has flown disproportionately to state-owned companies, particularly over the last five years, and uh, they've gotten the vast majority of the... But why do they make those decisions to do that? What's the motivation there? Is it well, there are various possible explanations. One is, you know, given the slowdown in, in the wake of the global financial crisis, this was the quickest way of trying to, you know, maintain reasonably rapid economic growth by pouring more resources into, into state companies. I happen to think it was the wrong decision. I think they could have gotten a lot more growth out of the private sector if they'd liberalized more. There are still many sectors uh, of the economy that are not open to private businesses. And when we look at the returns, uh, as uh, Lu Feng said, they're so much higher for private firms. I think if they had liberalized, uh, I mean, if, take for example the manufacturing sector. About 80% of all the investment in the manufacturing sector is by private companies. Uh, state companies are only doing about 10% of the investment. But in the service sector, the role of state companies is about five times higher. So and they have terrible returns, less than 2%. So if you'd liberalized access to the service sector, I think you would have had a lot of increased investment there. You'd have had more rapid economic growth. So you could have had a stimulus not through throwing more money at state companies, but by opening up more of the economy to investment by private firms. It's hard for leaderships in the world, right? It's to think that less control actually gives them more control. It's pretty tough. We see that well, historically. Well, it's not more control. It's more growth. If less control right. would give them more growth. That's not how they think about it, though, for some reason. Tell me, you, you, you mentioned, so there are a number of legacy issues that prevents China from performing at its peak capacity in terms of GDP growth. You mentioned some of them. What's the most important one? A misallocation of capital. And that's because of the politically uh, directed lending, with the, the discussion that money should go more to the uh, state-owned enterprises? Well, I think, what, I think what we need to start focusing on more is that a huge share of the increased lending in recent years has been coming from smaller banks, city commercial banks, joint stock banks. The share of lending by the big state-owned commercial banks has declined quite dramatically. The really underperforming state-owned enterprises are those that are managed at the local level. They have returns that are close to 1%. And the share of those firms that can't cover their cost of capital is probably in the neighborhood of 70, 75 uh, percent. So I think the, the, the regulators have not allowed or haven't been able to uh, monitor the performance of these local banks. And I think they're under pressure from local political officials to keep these uh, inefficient companies going. And the regulator, uh, there was a very interesting report from the IMF a few years ago, the total staff of the Central Bank Regulatory Commission in China is about 850 people. Now that's nothing compared to what you'd expect to see in a market economy. And it hasn't changed in the last 10 years. And financial assets are probably Ooh, the at, roof. at least yeah. three to four times today what they were 10 years ago. The financial sector has grown extremely rapidly. So I think we probably have a lot of slippage in the uh, management, supervision, uh, and so forth of banks at the local level. Mr. Xu, I see you nodding your head fairly vigorously. And Mr. Liu as well, you, you agree? We want to both weigh in? Do you? Okay. Well, in terms of that, I think I want to make uh, several points. First, that the uh, status quo is important. Sometimes there is uh, there's a past dependent. We inherit a lot from the command economy, and uh, you cannot change that very quickly. Uh, second is that uh, policymakers in China 
has to strike a delicate balance among several goals. You have to maintain a stable economy, you have to reform, you have to in increase efficiency, which means that you cannot put all your resources and all your efforts on just one goal. So I think we, it's the history, I, I believe, the past 40 years has proved that uh, a piecemeal reform is much better than a shock. And I think China should uh, uh, maintain that kind of philosophy in the future. And uh, as I said before, that um, you may not be able to see a lot of change in just one year, but you're going to see a lot of change in five years and 10 years. Are you suggesting Mr. Lardy is being impatient, too impatient? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, Mr. Liu. So in terms of whether China's economy going to the market or the you know, oriented government intervention economy, to address this question, I think we need to ask uh, the, to look at the issue through at least two perspectives. Number one, I think whether the policymakers are willing to do that. Of course, you have to gorge about that. You know, on the basis of the information, make uh, public available, for example, the Congress speech, big speech, and the documents. So in terms of that interpretation, of course, I think the, the information is mixed, you know, you know, according to different, uh, different people, you know, different assessment. But on the other hand, I think there's another approach you look at the issue, you know, whether the actual situation, actual how can I, environment involved in a way to, how can I say, shape the policy evolution in certain directions. Why I said that? For example, in the 19th Congress, the bigger emphasis has been given to the high quality growth of the economy. Okay, more efficient growth of the economy. Then if you took that kind of the principle, you know, as the precondition, then you will ask the question, what kind of mechanism you can deliver the results of the high quality and the more efficiency growth? You know, I think in order to achieve that kind of objective, whether, you know, no, no matter you know, whether the policymakers, you know, specific officials want to do certain things, but in order to deliver that kind of the results, then you need to give the move, how can, how can I say, the role to the market mechanism to allow the you know, more efficient firms to play a bigger role. So in other words, to observe you know, what kind of the direction of the Chinese economy will evolve in future. I think not only look at the specific documents or specific issues, but look at you know, what's the so-called main contradictions you know, in China outlined by the 19th Congress. Of course, at the new stage, the people need high quality goods and service, you know, more efficient allocation of the resources in order to deliver that kind of resource. Gradually, I still think the you know, market mechanism will play a bigger role. Uh, Mr. Wang, with the understanding that you, your company is involved in SOE reform and, and, and working with the government, if you could maybe give us a little clue, though, one of the issues that, that Mr. Lardy raised is the allocation of capital to the SOEs. You said expect that things will get better when it comes to SOE reform in, in the coming year or so. Is that going to include less politically directed lending, do you think? Um, I think that uh, related to uh, SOE reform and uh, also uh, credit allocation, uh, we also need to think about the uh, new economy. Okay. One of the, of course, the important new economy firm is leased here, okay, as Alibaba is right. So, so in a way, if you look at the new economy, basically, that is uh, the new economy part, Lufen also mentioned about the economy, three economies. I think the new economy part is really driven China's growth. It's not so much about SOE, SOE in that sense, okay. But the old economy relies so much on bank lending. The new economy doesn't rely so much on bank lending, okay. The new economy rely a lot on equity financing, and they started with equity financing from PE, VC, all that from the beginning. And so if you look at the, uh, the most valuable companies nowadays, those are Alibaba and Tencent and, and so on, mm -hmm. okay? How much do they borrow from the banks? How much do they need to borrow from the banks? Do they grow, the, you know, does their growth depend on the bank lending? Okay, mm -hmm. we need to be careful about that, okay? So in a way that I think that we see a, a very strong and vibrant uh, you know, new economy, 
And that is Bomi that really doesn't really need that much, you know, allocation. So are, I think are you that suggesting that less uh, lending to the SOEs really doesn't matter that much because good private sector companies are doing just fine? No, I, I, I think that we need to put this into a certain perspective, mm -hmm. which is to say that, uh, yes, SOEs probably, uh, you know, attract a, a, a bit more of our lending, but that's fixing a, maybe a smaller part of the economy's problem. And, 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 you know, if they, uh, I think that uh, if, we, uh, if China continue to push for market reform, I think China will, then I think the role of private sector will be even, big, uh, even bigger. Yeah. Well, the, the Chinese financial system will be moving towards a more equity, you know, finance system. And right. so in a way that, uh, and uh, so we are only focused, if we keep talking about the credit, uh, credit allocation, we focus on yesterday's problem, or maybe the day before yesterday's problem. Hmm. I mean, I kind of think the reason I mean, the SOEs have to get political yeah. lending is because yeah. they couldn't actually access the equity markets because no investor in their right mind would actually give it to them, right? Yeah, I think yeah. that uh, in particular at a New York Stock Exchange, we should talk about equity instead of so much about credit. Right. Yeah. I mean, but wouldn't, it, wouldn't your economy be stronger if those large, basically government-backed institutions were run more efficiently and hence could attract equity investment instead of government-backed lending? Well, let's say that uh, if you look at the last round of SEC reform, mm -hmm. I think the, the hallmark of success, the major uh, milestone of success is listing on, in, on Hong Kong stock exchange, yeah. on Shanghai stock mm -hmm. yeah. Again, through equity finance. It's not so right. much about those, uh, you know, well, do we need to create, uh, you know, provide more credit to this, to this large SOE so that uh, they become successful? No. Right. And Chairman Xi's company, for example, the, you know, China Merchant Group and the, you know, China Merchant Bank become very successful because they list on stock exchange. I think that's really the key. So I think that, uh, I think that, uh, yes, you know, we need to, you know, we need to uh, keep an eye on, 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 on bank credit. But we also uh, should not lose a bigger side, which is that uh, if China can continue to grow its economy, I think China will. If China can continue to reform its, uh, its economy, uh, which it will, I think, then I think that we should also see a major change of the financial system towards American type of system, which is a more uh, equity-based uh, based financial system. So we, we, I, I suggest that we should not focus too much on banking lending. That's my point. The, the head of the NYSC will come back and get yeah. some references for yeah, who they could list with. <laughs> we're working very closely with the NYSC. Well, he's our partner, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want to say something, Mr. Lardy? I well, see you kind of I, nodding your head. I, I think I disagree a little bit with Hajo. He's downplaying bank lending. The total amount of new funds raised in the Chinese stock market last year was worth about two weeks' worth of bank lending. Uh, That's a pretty good number for context. Yeah, but if you look at the, the, the do you include the Hong Kong market and also the New York, uh, NYSE, Nasdaq, all that, or it's just the, uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen? Shanghai, Shenzhen. Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, the growing In part other words, the, the equity market is doing very little to help the growth of companies in China. Well, that's, uh, I'm not so sure about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is President Trump a threat to China's economy? <laughs> we, we should have a vote of the amount of audience, uh, audience so that people will provide an answer, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't see anybody really wanting to jump in there. <laughs> well, let me ask it a different way. Um, my network spends a lot of time with members of the Trump administration in the last year talking about the economy. We're a business network. There are a lot of business people in the administration. Uh, even before they joined the government, they were on CNBC a lot, and they, they do now. One of the big issues that comes up frequently, Wilbur Ross in particular brings it up, the Secretary of Commerce, is the steel sector. He's very, very frustrated, frustrated by the steel sector. If I could use the steel sector uh, in an emblematic or symbolic way to talk about what's going to happen with China and with trade. He puts up a huge graphic that shows where China has verbally promised to reduce capacity in the steel sector, and it's, you know, 20 times on the chart, and every single year, Chinese steel capacity goes up and production goes up. Um, and so he feels that they actually, the government actually hasn't lived up to its word. So you've got a lot of capacity, gluts the market, pushes prices lower. A lot of those companies don't run profitably at all, and yet fears of people being unemployed keeps those factories running. Are we ever going to see any change? I just bring this up because this one particular sector would go a long way 
to easing tensions with the United States. You see any changes coming? Steel sector is uh, highlighted, uh, you know, and in the industrial policies in last several decades, actually. So the steel output in China increased from something like 100 billion million tons, you know, to in the beginning of the new century to the more than 800 million tons you know, in 2014 or something like that. But in recent years, actually, the output has been stabilized or even slightly declined a little bit, you know. So number one, I think, you know, in the 2012 to 2015, you know, and over these three years, maybe there's a very serious overcapacity, you know, and uh, also, you know, and the lack of demand in this sector, you know, a lot of structural, restructured work has been done over there. And also the government policy has been emphasized on, you know, and reducing of the capacity. But uh, number two, I think in recent years, actually, I don't think uh, the overcapacity in steel sector is still that kind of serious. Even though, you know, I know a lot of reports mentioned, you know, the utilization ratio of the capacity is very low, or even declining, you know. But I, on my limited experiences to visit some fields and to visit some, you know, steel factories, I don't think that kind of assessment is very good. So in other words, a lot of the capacities maybe has already observed already, you know, after shutdown, I don't think, Unless there's a huge demand, okay, there's a very strong market incentives. I don't think this kind of capacity will be, how can I revitalize, you know, reopen again. So in other words, I, I, I have a big doubt about the reported ratio of the utilization capacity in the steel sector in recent years. One very strong evidence to indicate you know, now maybe the main problem in the steel sector is not on the demand side, but on the supply side, is the drastic price hike we observed in the steel sector. Of course, it has been caused by the policy, regulation, whatever, a lot of the factors. But I give in that kind of the evidence over the last two years also, uh, you know, very strong price increase, but on the other hand, very sluggish output growth and the supply side uh, responses. So it doesn't make any sense to me, you know, to still say there's an overcapacity there. The final issue is a trade issue. There's always a problem because the steel sector as a manufacturing sector, productivity growth, technology growth in China is much, much faster than other countries, including in this country. For example, the I and D staffs in a big steel sector could be hundreds or even a thousand. But to my knowledge, maybe in this country, the number is much smaller. So in other words, you know, even though there's a reduce of the capacity in China, whether this kind of the restructure or adjustment can solve the trade problems, that is another issue. So Mr. Liu actually rejects the premise of, of the criticism from the, the White House. Um, Mr. Zhu, I saw you, you raised the whole issue of the politicization of trade at the very beginning. You want to weigh in there yeah. on the steel sector? Well, I think that uh, there are certain economic forces played behind the, the trade pattern between China and U.S. You know, let me ask you a question. Is steel sector continue to be the competitive advantage sector of the United States? Because when you have different kind of advantage, you should exit from that sector. And uh, you know that the uh, US, as the uh, most powerful advanced economy, they do have uh, produce a lot of things that Chinese economy needs. But uh, they don't just export that to us. So that, I think, uh, to some extent, create the problem. That's the one point. The second point is that, you know, that the, regard the steel sector, actually, China's, China's government has taken uh, decisive efforts to ease the problem in that sector. If you look at supply side reform, the capacity utilization in the steel sector in China has come down to five, to five years low, and the, the price of steel rebar in China has been more than doubled 
in the past two years. That reflects that the efforts uh, uh, implemented by the Chinese government to address the overcapacity issue, uh, issue a problem in that sector. And I think that will help the U.S. steel factories, uh, uh, steel factory in the United States. That's the second point. The third point is that I think that when we talk about trade, let's do not politicalize that. Because too late. I, 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 <laughs> that ship yeah. has sailed. <laughs> well, you know that um, uh, because we have already seen a beneficial cycle in the trade data, which means that the uh, U.S. benefit from a greater external demand and China also benefit from greater external demand, and uh, trade frictions could end that uh, beneficial uh, cycle. And uh, I think that the uh, trade war is a no-win situation, and uh, that is the last thing we want to see uh, in, in, the 20, in 2018. So, Mr. Lardy, Mr. Xu makes the point that perhaps China has a competitive advantage when it comes to steel versus the United States, and that explains some of the issues. But, but isn't it hard to know whether or not that's the case if a government is subsidizing an industry heavily? Well, I don't, uh, I would say uh, for the openers, I don't think there's any doubt that China is the low cost steel producer in the world. Regardless. It's, pardon? Yes. Regardless. Mm -hmm. Most of the steel in China is now being produced by private companies. They're investing very heavily. They're modernizing. They're improving product quality. They're reducing costs, introducing new varieties. There's been almost no investment in the steel industry in the United States for more than, uh, I don't know, at least a decade, probably much longer. So China has an extraordinary advantage. The problem comes in the state steel sector, which is producing about, uh, about 30 percent of total output. And those are, in many years, companies that are losing money. They can't cover their cost of capital. They must be getting some kind of subsidy. So I think the only way to address this problem sensibly is to kind of disaggregate the Chinese steel industry. There's a very productive, very profitable private sector producing most of the steel. There's a much smaller state-owned sector that is not investing. Private investment in steel now is running about three to four times state investment. Uh, there's a much smaller state sector that's not modernizing, is high cost, losing money, and probably being subsidized. So we shouldn't be attacking the whole steel industry. We should be focusing attention on that portion of it that's uh, in control of the state. And I think we have to recognize that most of the steel is, is being produced by private companies, and they're the lowest cost steel producers in the world. So, Wilbur so I, Ross. I would tend to agree with Mr. Shu. This is, a, this is not an industry in which the United States could, could easily compete. And, and so it's, it's not a, a good example for Wilbur Ross to use when he's making the case in terms of being tougher on China. Well, I think you should, as I say, I think it should be more focused on the state companies, which are mm -hmm. undoubtedly the ones getting some subsidies and undoubtedly the ones that are the source of the excess capacity. Uh, the private companies are making plenty of money, relatively high return on assets, and I don't think they're getting any subsidies. Mr. Wang, you want to weigh in here? You got no, anything? I, no, I, I, you're I good. Agree. I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, we're gonna go to audience questions very soon. Uh, my last question is, what should I have asked you or did you expect me to ask you? <laughs> this is often where I get the most interesting answers on an interview, but maybe not today. <laughs> Mr. Wang, is there anything that you thought should be said today? Uh, I think that we talked a lot about uh, uh, you know, uh, China's economy. Uh, and also the China's economic relationship with the uh, United States. Um, uh, let's not forget the Asia, uh, the HCL market last year is one of the best market. At the New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange has a competitor from Hong Kong, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. You mean competing for listings and eventually getting? No, 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 not in that sense. Friendly. Okay. I mean, the, the performance is better. <laughs> okay. So I suggest the, the audience that uh, some of you invest in China. Well, let's say that I would suggest in the audience that uh, don't forget to invest in China, and uh, there are great opportunities ahead in 2018. Mr. Lin. Mr. Lardy. Uh, well, I think the question you didn't ask that might have been asked is um, in, who's going to be the winner uh, the relative terms of a likely trade war between the United States and China. And what's the answer? Oh, my answer definitely is China's going to win. They, they have the ability to withstand pain a great deal more than the United States does. So 
I think, <laughs> I think even though you know exports relative to GDP are higher in China, that's a misleading, a misleading indicator. The, the real pain is going to be forced on the supply companies in Southeast Asia, East Asia. And I think that the losers in the United States will be very highly concentrated in a few sectors, and they will organize politically uh, and make it difficult for Trump to maintain protectionist policies. Mr. Liu, what should I have asked? I, asked, I expect to ask the final question in the program. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the housing sector. No, no, no mic microphone on. Sorry. Yeah, uh, the housing sector policy, but uh, Go ahead, answer it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the answer? What, what about the housing sector? Uh, is, I, is there a bubble in the, in the yeah, real estate I, sector? I, I think to some extent that the, the housing sector, you know, and the situation as well as policy highlights as imperial case to the general discussion we are about now. Number one, I think, uh, indicates China economic growth still have a big potential because China is still undergoing the process of rapid urbanization. So in other words, over the last five years also, for example, average growth of the housing sales in the urban areas is something like 15% per annum, you know. But number two, the sustainable growth of the housing sector still troubled still dragged down by the institutional distortion, especially government, you know, monopoly of the land, you know, supply, you know, in the urban sector for the housing sector. So in other words, that kind of the behavior of the monopolistic behavior of the land supply, you know, caused, you know, reduction of the land supply and hiking of the land prices as a result, you know, and supported or or fueled the, the, the housing bubbles or housing you know, price hikes. Finally, number three, I think it facing the housing bubbles, the government have to control the demand, you know, have to impose various unprecedented regulations on the demand. You know. But on the other hand, also introduce the various measures on the supply side. Then that highlights, you know, in order to type out the growth potential in China, you need to do a lot of reform to address these kind of institutional distortions, to type out the uh, growth potential associated with the, you know, and the rapid urbanization, because China is a huge country. The growth in China will have implications for the world. Do you expect them to address any of those issues, whether it's land reform no, they, or they in doing, the coming year? They are doing that already, but it's a very tough issue. Again, I mentioned that, you know, not only look at the documents, but also look at the actual evolution of the situation and which how do policymakers respond to that kind of change. That is the more, you know, and the fundamental way to look at the issue. Mr. Zhu, what should I have asked or did you expect me to ask? Well, the, the first question I want to be asked is the, how to understand China from the Chinese economy from an American perspective. I think a lot of questions you asked before boils down to that question. Because China looks like quite different from the United States, they have a different model, and we know where the United people in the United States are not very certain about uh, the direction that China Chinese economy are moving. But to me, I think I want to make two points. First, that uh, the past 40 years' experience has told us, told our Chinese people, the market is the best means to achieve our dream, our Chinese dream. A second point is that, well, it's complicated. And uh, we, have, we are facing a lot of constraints in realities. And so we are take a pragmatic bro approach to reform our economy to a more market-oriented market model. And that's why we have, for the moment, have a different model seem to you. But I think in the long run, in the long run, maybe in the next decade or two decades or later, we will look much more similar, uh, much more similar than we are in nowadays. So patience is what we need. That's a nice way to end. All right, are there audience questions? This lady right here, I don't know if somebody's carrying a microphone. I see this lady here in the white turtleneck. Hi, um, this is Loretta from Wind Info. I have a question for Mr. Huang. Um, in your previous talk, you mentioned the companies raising capital um, in the equity markets such as Alibaba and Tencent. 
Now, how about companies? I mean, the unlisted companies such as Huawei, they raise capital in like the U.S. dollar bond in the U.S. market. How do you, um, what's your opinion to say the benefits for companies to do this? Thanks. Um, I, I think that uh, um, some companies want to uh, uh, do IPO, become a public list company. Uh, which is very reasonable. I think that we work on that. Some companies, for other reasons, uh, they don't want to be listed in the stock exchange. Uh, they do want to grow. Then, then of course, that uh, it, it, you know, in, in terms of financing, it comes down to uh, credit. You know, Nick talked a lot about that. Or they, uh, you know, bank through bank loan. I mean, credit through bank loan or credit through uh, through through bond. Okay. For Huawei, I think that uh, uh, my understanding of Huawei is that Huawei probably doesn't want. To or it's not ready to be listed in any of the stock change yet. So, so you know, Huawei has a great business model. You know, has a has a great technology, and uh, you know, has great potential to grow. So, when it need capital, it, it can you know borrow from bank or or basically the issue bond. I think that uh, Huawei's bond should be uh, you know uh, 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 enjoy a uh, high uh, credit rating, and so that's another way to grow business. More questions. A uh, gentleman here with the glasses. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard Black uh, with the Schiller Institute. There was an important conference in December. The Central Economic uh, Work Conference was addressed by President Xi, and it was pulled together under the framework of Xi Jinping thought on socialist economy with Chinese characteristics for a new era. <clears throat> I thought one of the interesting discussion points was replacing GDP with a new metric. And my understanding is that this is being discussed at the very highest levels in China. That is a new metric based upon rates of technological innovation integrated into the economy, people's livelihood, and sustainability. Now, one would say, how could you possibly replace GDP? Well, China's authority, having lifted 700 million people out of poverty in the So last is there a years, question? Yeah, that, yeah, the question is clear. <laughs> Just let me finish. China's authority to define a new metric is very, very clear. So I would, Professor Liu, I would ask your comments first on this idea of a new metric replacing GDP as it's being discussed in China today. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you are correct, actually, in the, in the recent conference, including 19 Congress, as well as working, uh, Central Working Conference, also emphasized on the new policy, uh, such as the idea of the Xi Jinping's uh, thought on the you know, Chinese socialism with, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, new era, in the new era. Also, in the economic policy, the, the priority has been given to sort of the, you know, and the high quality growth, you know, more efficient growth. So all these ideas, I think, to some extent, can be looked at as elaboration of the new development idea, you know, developed by Xi Jinping in his the first uh, chairmanship period over the last five years. But uh, I think you ask a very good question, you know, how to uh, approach the relationship between the growth or growth rate and other policy objectives we mentioned already, like the high quality, like the high efficiency. I think they, they should be, they should not be competitive, they should be complementary, you know. So in that words, in order to achieve high quality growth, you know, you need market mechanism, but also you need, uh, high income, you know, when the people income, per capita income grows higher, then of course they will demand, they, want, they wish to pay for high prices for the high quality goods and services. So in other words, I think these are complementary. But on the other hand, I think it is a right thing, you know, and it is correct and for the policymakers to play down, you know, to overemphasize to, to avoid the overemphasis of the growth rate, you know, for specific numbers, you know, for specific period. That has been sort of the general practice in the past. I think they want to adjust for that kind of the, uh, practice. So uh, in summary, I think uh, the reasonable, sustainable, you know, environmental friendly high growth rate is, it still should be necessary 
as well as desirable. But on the other hand, you know, we should take a balanced approach, you know, not only emphasize on the growth rate, but also on other welfare indicators uh, outlined in your question statement. Thank you. Yeah, it's not without precedent. I mean, Cuba includes a happiness factor in its GDP measures. Um, how about this gentleman right here? Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Hagstrom. I'm from China Daily. Um, you spoke a lot about the, the trade war um, and the potential impact on uh, the U.S. and Chinese economy. Um, I'm curious, what do you think uh, should be done um, about the uh, uh, to deal with the uh, trade deficit um, at this point, if if anything? We should repeal the tax reform. <laughs> because the tax reform is going to make the U.S. global trade and current account deficit go up. It's going to raise interest rates. There'll be capital inflow. The trade deficit will be going up. I think it's almost inevitable. Uh, so I think the only way to deal with the, trade, with the trade deficit is through broad macroeconomic policy. So if your real objective is to reduce the trade deficit, you have to look at savings and investment rates um, as the, you know, the ultimate underlying causes. You know, threatening the Chinese with high tariffs or other kinds of trade protection uh, is not going to uh, be effective in reducing the deficit. Uh, one of my colleagues, Larry Kudlow, who uh, has often been considered to be in the current administration, raises this all the time on CNBC. It's one of his great frustrations with the Trump administration, the focus on the trade deficit. He, sa he sees it as a signal of success, actually, and that with tax reform, he thinks it's absolutely going to go up, and that's because there's going to be more investment here, et cetera. So it's a constant right. battle that we discuss on the air. I think this is one of the big mysteries of this administration. They have set up a metric for success, reducing deficits, in which they are certain to fail. Why would you set as your central objective a, a, a metric that you couldn't possibly achieve and you were likely to be moving in what you would consider to be the wrong direction? So it's a reflection of, uh, I think, you know, it's a fundamental flaw in the way the at least the people that are articulating this policy, starting with the president and going on down, uh, a fundamental flaw in terms of their understanding of how the global economy works. I haven't, any questions on that side of the room? I haven't, right here in the front. Hold on, you're gonna get a mic. Hi, Jason Doe. I can, actually, I bought my bachelor's degree in, from Peking University in Computer Science. I attend the, fellowship program two years ago when I was at Cornell. So my question is, as like uh, people with our background, like we grew up in China, study and work now in the U.S. So when we face the conflict and the competition between, the chi between China and U.S., which side should we stand when we have to choose? What do you mean, like in choosing where you want to work or when people confront you and I, I don't... No, no. Uh, I mean, when we need to make a decision regarding the trade-off between in favor of Chinese interest or the U.S. interest. Mm -hmm. So how should we choose? Do you feel conflicted in that way? Yeah, yeah. For example, we are doing like a... Call the mic to your mouth, please. I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like uh, when we have this kind of dual background, right? So that the trade competition. So like uh, which when we, when we grow up, we need to make a decision. We need to have to choose one side to stand. So we should do... Uh, wait, how should we choose? You can live in two countries simultaneously, if we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, that's a very, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, I think a lot of Americans would be puzzled by it because there's, such, there's been such historically strong immigration in the United States, you know, like little kids in the United States, when you're growing up, I'm half Scottish and I'm half French. Me, I'm half, when I was growing up, I'm half Italian, I'm half Cuban. Like, we don't have this kind of issue about choosing one over the other. It's a melange, I guess. Anybody else want to try to tackle that question? But clear, I mean, clearly, I bet you're not alone in facing that, uh, that internal conflict. 
though I, I'm not quite sure why it has, has to be necessarily. Anybody else want to weigh in before we move on? I see everybody looking perplexed here. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, this lady here with the scarf. Um, I know that the, uh, the Chinese speakers, most of you are educated in America, and we have been hearing constantly, make America again, um, especially from President Trump coming to the office with that slogan. So in your view, um, you've been educated here, you know America well, and then you certainly know China well. So what do you think of how America can make America great again? <laughs> That's a good question. I should have asked that. <laughs> Go ahead. American people will definitely make, a, make America great again. Whether this job will be done by current president, I'm not sure. Let's w w watch and see. We call that a punch, <laughs> but all right. <laughs> Mr. Zhu, Mr. Liu. Okay. Go ahead, jump ball. I, I think, actually, America, in, 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 in my observation, has always been, especially in the last century, always been great, you know, and never has been declined to the second, you know, and the class country. So, in other words, you know, in the current circumstances, you know, the make American great again, that reflects anxieties, you know, and maybe by some Americans, you know, in the new environment, you know, whether you know America can respond to the challenge of the new era, new environment. So, in order to address the issue, I think the traditional, a lot of the value systems, a lot of principles of policy, you know, and uh, demonstrated in the great Americans' history, should be preserved, but also adopted to the new uh, situation. So that is that could be a very interesting process, you know, we observe. Thank you. I think, you. Well, I think you should look at what made the U.S. great in the past. I think that is U.S. embraced the market, U.S. embraced the talents from all over the world. I think that is what U.S. need in nowadays to make U.S. great again. Mr. Lai, she addressed the question to the Chinese participants on the panel, but I bet you have an opinion. <laughs> okay, gentlemen back here with the glasses in the penultimate row. John Oden, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Alliance Bernstein. Um, I think we've heard some really good things today about growth and what have you. Feel pretty good about it. Certainly, there are some problems. I'm concerned about the environment in China, namely air water, and traffic. I realize this is a big topic, but would anyone like to take a sweeping stab at addressing what you see going forward to improve those three things? I think I can answer that. You know, uh, you have to prioritize things when you only have limited resources. So when you are a poor country, food is the most important thing. So growth is the most important thing. And when China now has entered the legal of the middle-income countries, other things like environment become more valuable to us than in the past. So we have taken efforts to improve that. So if you look at the air conditioner, uh, air conditioning indicator in Beijing in this winter, well, it's much better than in in past several years. So this the government has done things, uh, the, the economy has done things, and uh, this measures has has taken progress, has making meaningful progress. And uh, I, so I was optimistic about, um, on, on that front. I, I believe that the air condition and the, the, the traffic will be better in future. And by the way, that is also a good investment opportunities for China, for Chinese people. So we, we will uh, invest more money on that front to make people have a better living standard in China. Mr. Wong, I saw you lean into the mic. Did you want to answer? Um, China, uh, as China economy grows, I think that uh, China certainly is facing some new challenges, including on environment, water, traffic, all that. Yeah. On environment, I think that uh, uh, you know, uh, 
over the last few years, you can probably see noticeable uh, improvement in uh, large cities, Beijing, I think that's. If we compare that with some of the other uh, developing countries, uh, large similar cities, say New Delhi or uh, uh, Mexico City, I think that uh, the progress China has made over the last few years, I think it uh, should, uh, should be appreciated, I think. Um, uh, they, uh, we, we talk about, the, one, of, yeah, one of the gentlemen talk about the, the new metrics for uh, in the new era. I think that in the you know, one, uh, important part of the new metrics of, uh, in the new era for, for, for China's economy will also include in, uh, you know, substantially on how to improve the quality of life, including, of course, uh, focus on environment, traffic, and, and all that. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, we will see more progress in that area. And, and I think that uh, we are confident that uh, you know there, there will be very strong uh, Chinese government, government governmental commitment. By the way, uh, China continue to commit to the Paris Accord. President Trump pulled out the U.S. out of the, the, the Accord. So watch out U.S. environment for the next few years, or maybe for the next decade. Well, I would just point out that U.S. emissions have gone down while Chinese emissions have gone up, though. I mean, it's one thing to say you're committed to the accord. It's another thing to actually reduce emissions. They're two different things, right? Well, I think that uh, if you really think about the for global public good perspective, mm -hmm. I think that both U.S. and China, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. being the largest uh, economy and, uh, and China, the second largest economy, uh, both of them have a great responsibilities. Mm -hmm. the U.S. does not want to really, you know, the current administration, uh, you know, committed to uh, to basically participate in pr providing such a public, uh, global public good. But reconcile the fact that our emissions have gone down while your emissions have gone up in terms of actually achieving the underlying goal of the Paris Accord. Has well, one country been better at it than no, the other? No, U.S. should provide its own contribution, but U.S. is not willing to provide its contribution for, to uh, the great uh, public good of the world, is right? No, I think no. that's the point. I think the private sector has achieved it without a government dictate from above. Well, that's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I think that when it comes to environment, I think that government, I do believe the government has a role to play because it's, it's, uh, it's in the dimension of public good. Fair enough. Um, but the overall message uh, that we've heard so far uh, Mr. Liu, is that that gentleman should not worry about the environment in China. It's getting better. Is that true? I think uh, the environment issue is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, understandable because China economy is growing very fast. Every country, especially a large country, when they experience a rapid economic growth, usually they are facing environmental pressures. But on the other hand, I think China has more acute problems. For example, we just not talked about uh, the steel issues. We never see in any country in the history in the world, you know, several hundred million tons of the war capacity and output are produced by relatively, you know, and the limited areas in the coastal areas. So in other words, this kind of concentration of the heavy industry make the environmental issues well ordinary traditionally occurred in other countries, even acute in China. So how to solve the problems? I think you have to you know, solve the problem through two channels. Number one, you have to use in the market mechanism. You, you, you restructure your economy, economic measures. For example, like the steel sectors, you, know, you, know, you have to make new investment you know, to make uh, new use of the new technology. For example, I visited also several small steel mills in the Tansan province, Tansan city, actually pollution very heavy. But on that hand, another big uh, and, uh, steel factory like the Cao Fei Dian, they, they, they use the cutting edge technology. Actually, environmental issues have been solved more or less, you know and very clean environmental issues in the factory. So number two, uh, actually emphasized by my colleagues, you, the government have to play a role. Actually, I think the government uh, put a lot of efforts in recent years. You know, you can see as an uh, ordinary resident in Beijing, you can notice improvement of the environment, especially in the air. So in summary, I think that the problems are there, serious, it's challenging, but I think uh, if you know we face that, deal with that, gradually we can solve that. Thank you, Mr. Lada. You travel to China a lot. Is the pollution getting better? On the environment? Yeah. 
I'm not sure it's getting better. It's uh, maybe getting worse at a much slower pace. <laughs> uh, and I mean, there's no doubt air pollution in Beijing has improved, but you know, this is a teeny portion of the, of the overall economy. On the other hand, I am of the view that the regime is determined to uh, reduce these problems because it's an extremely uh, potent domestic political issue. I mean, you know, this government is not, does not stand for elections, but uh, I think the population has made it very clear that the levels of water and air pollution are unacceptably high, and I think the regime is going to bring it down. They're going to introduce carbon pricing and carbon trading and a lot of other things that uh, we haven't been willing to do in the United States. So I think we have to give them credit. So at least unanimous optimism that it's going to get better. One final question. This gentleman right here. Good morning, uh, Tristan Zhang, Helix Capital Partners. My question is, um, how, how, how does the Chinese government plan to regulate uh, the investments into decentralized currencies as it is being so hot? My you favorite know, topic, I can't believe uh, We I haven't covered that myself. yet, so I have, to, I have to kind of round it up with this. Thank you. So you're talking about Bitcoin, distributed ledger technology, all cryptocurrencies. Gentlemen? Mr. Wang, what do you think? The future of cryptocurrencies in China. We, we read that they are, there's been an order from the federal government that they have to do a disorderly wind down of mining in cryptocurrencies. Me? Yeah. Uh, uh, I like uh, you know, uh, traditional currency better. <laughs> so I have not, uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think this is a new era, and it's an interesting era to watch for. Uh, when it comes to uh, currency, uh, I'm always the one to, I always want to associate it with uh, sovereignty. So uh, all those kind of new uh, invention uh, really is not associated with any of sovereignty. I don't, think, I don't think the Federal Reserve would like it at one point. So let's watch and see. So okay. I think that I would remind you to watch for sovereignty. Sovereignty is the key word in, the, in all the currency area. Uh, Mr. Liu. Bitcoin. Mining, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, what's the future in China? That, you know, only casual observation. So I don't think I'm in the position to comment on that issue. I know the Chinese government uh, recently take a very, you know, conservative policy shift on, you know, that kind of new innovation, you know. And also I know a lot of my friends, you know, spend a lot of efforts to <laughs> calculate how much electricity you need to consume, you know, and to dig in mining that kind of the currency, but uh, my knowledge on that is limited. Thank you. Mr. Zhu, what do you think, the future of uh, cryptocurrencies in China? Well, to me, it looks like a bubble. And uh, you know that, as Juan mentioned, printing money is a sovereign power. And the uh, government will only allow other people to share that profit. And the second is that I think that the, on the technology front, the things like Bitcoin is not uh, good enough to meet the transaction need in the daily, on the daily basis in the, in the real economy. And the third thing is that I think the demand for this uh, distributed coins comes, a, a large part of the demand comes from this illegal activity such as money laundering. And that is not something we can live with uh, from the current point of view. So I believe that these things will continue consistently under heavy pressures from the government. And, uh, in terms of the number of transactions that he's talking about, Bitcoin can, for example, only process seven transactions a second, where Visa can do you know, 30,000 a second. So as exactly. an underlying asset within distributed ledgers, there's a lot of skepticism about it. But the technology itself clearly is getting a lot of interest. Do you have any thoughts on uh, distributed ledger technology or blockchain, Mr. Lardy? No, got it. <laughs> I'm headed to Wenatchee, Washington State on a four o'clock flight today. Do you know why? It is the epicenter of Bitcoin mining in the United States because they only pay two and a half cents per kilowatt for, for uh, energy. And so everybody and their mother has moved their servers there and all their Bitcoin mining facilities there. It'll be live on Thursday. You can watch it all day. Um, that's my only commercial for myself. <laughs> this has been a real pleasure and an honor, very insightful in so many ways. Thank you, gentlemen. It was Thank great. You. Thank you.